Welcome back, I'm Rob Lang and this is my game Clomper. You live inside a mechanical ladybird called a Clomper, which you can control by laying pipes to power machines with steam. The outside world is a hellscape that you explore from inside the Clomper, picking up resources and completing quests. If that sounds like fun, like and subscribe for more. In this week's devlog, I've made good progress with my procedural map generation and you're going to learn about making your code more readable with C Sharp 7 tuples and operator overloading. This is my implementation of wave function collapse from last week. Explanation of that up in the corner. Each world square has a grey gizmo mesh for all the possible tiles. As the algorithm runs, yellow shows world squares that have been decided upon and the red ones are under investigation. My algorithm was wrong in a number of ways. Firstly, I was collapsing neighbours during the propagate phase, which is far too early. That's why there are yellow corner squares that should be joined up to a straight edge out in the middle. With that fixed, you can start to see the square hills appearing. However, there are still annoying corners appearing. That was because I'd not calculated adjacency correctly. Adjacency is the logic that says which tile can go next to which. I'd implemented it wrong. To help understand what was going wrong, I updated the colours. White tiles have been decided upon, yellow ones are still being processed, and red are neighbours. As you can see, the algorithm has run away and is deleting bits, which means there are no valid tiles left for that square. That was another bug in adjacency. I was getting so many bugs in adjacency because I didn't have a good way to visualize what the adjacencies were. I added gizmos to my input tiles. The white one is the one I select and the blue ones are the adjacent tiles. I can now easily see where adjacency was at fault. This is what propagation looks like with only one tile collapsed. My tile set is being created in such a way that if you start on a corner like we do here, then there has to be a square hill there. With that working, I added a function to find the next tile to collapse, which let me generate a whole new space just like this. Off screen, I have two buttons, one to randomly generate the world and the other to reset. It creates a new world each time round and that is wave function collapse working. Now a 10 by 10 grid isn't much to explore, so I need the world to generate around the clomper. Wave function collapse was not designed with this idea in mind, so I've got a fight on my hands. Right now, I have it only generating the blank spaces. The challenge is to make wave function collapse work in an infinite space, which it is not designed to do but this is as far as I got this week. When your algorithm is complicated, I have found clean code instrumental in getting bug fixes turned around quickly. Stay tuned to learn about the importance of naming, tuples, overloading, and operators. I apologize if this half of the video is a little scruffy, it's unscripted. For this example, I've got a simple player as a ball in the world, and as we move it around, you can see the world is generating as a series of flat cubes. Not too dissimilar to Columper, but a bit simplified, so it'll be easier to see what's going on. With that said, let's move on and into the code. What we have at the top is we have the number of tiles we're going to generate away from the player, and we've got our actual world that's stored in a dictionary of vector two ints and game objects and we're going to come back to that and see how we can improve that. We have the transform of the player which we need to know to generate the world. To start off with we just set the origin to the zero and we create the world tiles. In update we find where the player is from the point of view of the grid that the tiles are created on and then we create them. Here is the meat of the code the create world tiles method. As you can see, it takes in an origin around which it's going to build the world. It then has two for loops, one that runs through the X from negative world size to positive world size around the origin, 
world size is just an integer we set at the top. And then it does the same for Z. It goes through the origin, world size, origin, world size. We then create a vector 2 int from those two integers that we're looping through. We check to see if it's inside the world dictionary. And if it's not, then we create that new primitive cube in that location. The only other function we have is the player is grid method, which takes in the player's position, uses only the X and Z, and forms that into a vector 2 int by rounding to nearest integer. As it is, this code is pretty clean. You don't really need to do anything to it, but as you'd expand this code to add a better algorithm in, there are naming problems that will start becoming very complicated. You don't want to have to think. You want the code to describe itself without any ambiguity. And that's what we're now going to look at. The first thing that jumps out at me, and many of you will have already spotted this, is that when we loop through the Z, we're doing this weird thing with origin Y. Now the reason it's called Y is because for a vector 2 int, the second property of vector 2 int is Y, because it's X and Y. So reading this off in my head, I would see it as Z is Y minus world size, Z is less than Y plus world size, which is very, very strange. And then below, to create the location, we have a new vector 2 int, which if I look at the constructor, it says X and Y, except I'm passing in Z. That's too much mental load. So to fix that, we're going to create our own struct type called coordinate. So to make life a little easier, I'm going to be coding side by side. Our new type coordinate is on the right and our world class is on the left. I'm now going to replace vector2 int for coordinate using find and replace. So now we can change this y parameter of the vector2 int to be the z of the coordinate. So now this int of 4 is dealing only with z's. The next thing that jumps out at me is this player as grid method, which takes in a player position and returns a coordinate. Everything about this method is about coordinates, so it really shouldn't be in the world class, it should be inside our new coordinate struct. And we're going to do that using a new constructor. The next piece of complexity I don't like is performing these calculations inside the for loops. So let's use some implicit operators to make dealing with coordinates a little easier. Ideally, what I would like to do is something like this. I would like to take origin and subtract the world size, and then I would like to take origin and add the world size. Now I can't do that at the moment because I haven't told C Sharp how to add an integer onto a coordinate. So let's add in an implicit operator to do that. This is the overloaded operator for addition. It tells C-sharp what to do when we want to add an integer to a coordinate. And in this case, we just create a new coordinate and add the integer to both X and Z. And that's it. Now, I can tidy this up even more because we're in C-sharp by turning this into a bodiless method. Very tidy. Let's now take subtraction. It's done in the same way. So now we have these two min and max, we can then go through and update our for loops. So the next thing I want to try and improve is the use of this constructor here, the coordinate 0, 0. Now, bright ones among you will know that if I just create a new coordinate without passing in 0, 0, then the default will be 0, 0, because they're both integers, and the default number for an integer is 0. But I've created this slightly artificial situation, so I can show you tuples, which is fun to say. I know what you're thinking. What? Tuples? Really? This ugly nonsense? 
Many of you will see tuples and you'll think, well, that's horrible. And you know what? I would agree with you. But in C Sharp 7, they've made it much, much simpler. So we can now remove all of this section here. And magically, that still works. Now the compiler is complaining at us because we're not using tuple. But isn't this nice? Wouldn't it be great if we could do that? That it just magically knew that we were going to turn this tuple here into a coordinate. Well, we can do that with an implicit operator. Just going to remove my example tuple here. So over on our coordinate type, we're going to add an implicit operator for creating a coordinate from a tuple. It's strange syntax once again, but we have this thing called an implicit operator, which is another way of saying I'm assigning something. So in this case, we've taken in the tuple here. That's all it is, two ints inside a pair of parentheses into a coordinate, and then we take item one and item two out of that tuple exactly the same way as you would have done with the old style tuple. This is just syntactic sugar. Underneath the hood, it's still an old tuple. But then that allows us to do this wonderful little assignment here. Now before I show you a really cool use of this, I'm going to add in two more operators for adding coordinates together. So tacked on the bottom here, we have two new operators. They're just addition and subtraction operators for adding together two coordinates, coordinate A and coordinate B. It's ever so simple. So we have AX plus BX and AZ plus BZ. In conjunction with the implicit operator, that allows us to set up structures like this. This is a neighborhood structure. And what this does is take the current coordinate and then add each square that's around it. Now to my eye, that looks extremely neat. So now you know clean code refactoring by renaming, overloading operators and tuples. If you found that useful, hit like and subscribe. And if you have any questions or feedback, please do leave a comment. Until next time, stay safe. Bye-bye.